I'm really grateful to be here and to share my work with you. Um, I'm here because of a grant from UW-Madison uh, that has supported my work on a manuscript that um, looks at historical trauma in essays and in short fiction. Uh, so I don't really tell anybody's particular story. I create stories. Um, so my name is Roberta Hill. I am o Wisconsin Oneida, and I am a professor of English and American Indian Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I fell in love with a man from here whose name was, is Tony, and he lives over in Porcupine, South Dakota, and his family uh, is from Upper Cut Meat. Uh, we have a son, Jacob Hill, uh, who is enrolled here and who is taking pictures. He volunteered to help me. So um, he graduated from Madison College recently with a degree in graphic design. And um, when he was born, I was teaching. I taught here at Sinte Gleshka over uh, at Rosebud when it was at Rosebud and brought Jacob in from Upper Cut Meat in his cradle board. So um, I learned a lot here. And I think that the Lakota people on whatever reservation, but Rosebud particularly, are very wonderful people. Um, I was driving from Wisconsin, and I have an older sister, Rose, who lives in Portland. And she kept calling me, because um, uh, she was afraid that I was going to fall asleep at the wheel and crash. Uh, so I had to say to her, I'm a child of the 60s. You know, we drove everywhere. Gas was 29 to 39 cents a gallon. We thought nothing of getting in a car, a bunch of us, and going to the coast. You know, the California, coming back, you know, going over wherever we went. Went up to um, Onondaga, New York, wherever we wanted to go, we could go. So I just said, hey, I'm a child of the 60s. She answered, she said, as older sisters do, well, right now you're in your 60s. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm going to read some poems from my new collection that got published last spring. It's called Cicadas, New and Selected Poems. But I'm going to keep the reading short because I want to share with you uh, the research. And there's lots of research I tried to condense and point out what I could find as much as possible. Uh, I'm going to read something about the research. And then what I'd like to do is to um, read a few, if I have time, read just a few very short beginnings of short fiction, short stories. So this is a poem that I wrote uh, for Verdell Hollow Horn Bear because he was the man that I met um, when we were in Wisconsin. He came up to go to school at UW-Madison, and we, there were 13 of us at UW-Madison at that time. And um, so we had an Indian student organization to support all of us, and it was Verdell then who introduced me to Tony and a number of the other people who had come in uh, for a summer program in cooperative, were being trained in cooperative organization. And Verdell, as long as well as all of us, all 13 of us, you know, in Madison, we were feeling very uh, alienated from the campus life. There were more foreign students than there were Indians. And of course, when all we got together, uh, we drank, we carried on. You know, we uh, did all kinds of hell raising in our own ways. And so that was before any of us really understood about addiction and understood how addiction affects people. And unfortunately, Verdell, um, years later I found out, uh, learned in a newspaper that uh, he died um, as he was walking away from a treatment center in Wisconsin. And so I wrote a poem for him. Uh, he died on the Yellow River in Wisconsin called Reaching Yellow River. I tried to imagine what he must have experienced um, because he was a really wonderful man. It isn't a game for girls, he said, grabbing a fifth with his right hand, the wind with his left. 
For six days, I raced Jack Daniels. He cheated, told jokes. Some weren't any, even funny. That's how come he won. It took a long time to reach this yellow river. I'm not yet 30. Or is it 31? Figured all my years carried the same hard thaw. Out here, house lights hid deep inside the trees. For a while, I believed this road cut across to Spring Creek and I was trucking home. I could kid you now, say I ran it clean, gasping on one lung, loaded by a knapsack of distrust and hesitation. I never got the tone of all the talk of cure. I sang honor songs, crawled the railroad bridge to Canada. Dizzy from the ties, I hung between both worlds. Clans of blackbirds circled the nearby maple trees. The dark heart of me said, no days more than these. As sundown kindled the sumacs, stunned by the river's smile, I had no need for heat, no need to feel ashamed. Inside me then the sound of burning leaves. Tell them I tumbled through a gap on the horizon. No, say I stumbled through a hummock and fell in a pit of stars. When rain weakened my stride, I heard them singing in a burl of white ash. Took a few more days to rave at them in this wood. Then their Appaloosas nickered in the dawn and they came riding down a close ravine. Though the bottle was empty, I still hung on. Foxtails beat the grimace from my brow until I took off my pain like a pair of old boots. I became a hollow horn filled with rain, reflecting everything. The wind in my hand burned cold as hoarfrost when my grandfather nudged me and called out my Lakota name. Um, I keep him in my memory, and I was always grateful for having known him. One of the experiences we had when I lived here was, I know some of you probably still do this, um, we were up in Upper Cut Meat, and there was nothing, Tony thought nothing of getting in a car and traveling far away, like to Kilgore, Nebraska, or far all over, we traveled all over. And there was a time when, uh, as we were traveling in the car, I saw a coyote. And so this is a, probably a fairly um, anthologized poem called The Recognition. We learn too late the useless way light leaves footprints of its own. We traveled miles to Kilgore in the submarine closeness of a car, sand hills recalling the sea. A coyote slipped across the road before we knew. Night, the first skin around him. He was coming from the river where laughter calls out fish. Quietly, a heavy wind breaks against cedar. He doubled back, curious, to meet the humming moons we rode in this gully without grass or stars. Our footprints were foreign to him. He understood the light and paused before the right front wheel, a shadow of the mineral earth, pine air in his fur. Such dogs avoid our eyes, yet he recognized and held my gaze, a being both so terrible and shy, it made my blood desperate for the space he lived in broad water cutting terraced canyons, and ice gleaming under hawthorn like a floor of scales. Thick river, remember we were light, thanking light, slow music rising, trees perhaps, or my own voice out of tune. 
I danced a human claim for him in this gully, no stars. He slipped by us, old as breath, moving in the rushing dark, like moonlight through tamarack, wave on wave of unknown country. Crazed, I can't get close enough to this tumble wild and tangled miracle. Night is the first skin around me. That was from my first collection called Star Quilt. I'm going to read a section of a poem from my second collection, which didn't do as well, and it was called Philadelphia Flowers. And I'm going to read the kind of inspirational moment that led me to call it Philadelphia Flowers and to write Philadelphia Flowers, a long, longer poem. I've done research. I have a, a doctorate in American Studies from the University of Minnesota. And when I was doing research, I ended up in Philadelphia trying to track and understand my grandmother's life. My grandmother had a very strange life. She was the second American Indian woman doctor, physician, allopathic physician in the US. And uh, she had been taken from her family at a very young age. People don't know what her early connections are to the Mohawks, but she was told that she was Mohawk. And so I was in Philadelphia um, going to the different places, trying to get the research, find out more about her early life. She was raised by Quakers and um, was considered, um, or who knows whether or not it's actually true, but um, at a certain point in her life, she was told by the man who was her guardian that uh, he was her father. And he was a Quaker physician by the name of Joshua Gibbons Allen. So I was doing research for um, this, and I'm walking through the streets, <laughs> and I run into a man, a tall, thin black man, who is selling flowers. And for some reason, we have moments like this that just sort of hit you, and this moment hit me. Uh, from Philadelphia Flowers, uh, part three. Passing Doric colonnades of banks and walls of dark glass, passing Press the button, visitors, please, Liberty Townhouses. I turned a broad street near the Hershey Hotel and headed toward the doorman outside the Bellevue. Palms and chandeliers inside. A woman in mauve silk and pearls stepped into the street. I was tracking my Mohawk grandmother through time. She left a trace of her belief somewhere near Locust and 13th. I didn't see you, tall, dark, intense, with three bouquets of flowers in your hand. On Walnut and Broad, between the Union League and the Indian campsite, you stopped me, shoving flowers toward my arm. At least I'm not begging, you cried. The desperation in your voice spiraled through my feet while I fumbled the few bucks you asked for. I wanted those flowers, iris, ageratum, goldenrod, and lilies, because in desperation you thought of beauty. I recognized the truth and human love you acted on, your despair echoing my own. Forgive me, I should have bought more of those Philadelphia flowers passed hand to hand so quickly I was stunned a block away. You had to keep your pride, as I have done, selling these bouquets of poems to anyone who will take them. After our exchange, grandmother's track grew clearer. I returned for days, but you were never there. If you see her, small, dark, intense, with a bun of black hair and the gaze of an orphan, leave a petal in my path, then I'll know I can go on. <clears throat> I'm gonna read one last poem, a short poem. It's taken me years to be able to write a short poem. Um, I write very long poems. <laughs> and uh, when I was studying in Montana, that's one thing 
that I learned was that poets need to write all kinds of poems, but I needed room, <laughs> so I write long poems. This is called Not Yet, and it's from the third section called Cicadas. <clears throat> the earth is not yet a boarding school with a headmaster beating one march and everyone following its laboring force as their handed blades to cut out the sun. A blade is still a leaf to someone. Let's not send our children to become feed or to fuse their fire to the greed of corporate boards. Let's be heretics today, dancing outside earshot, unfurling Mandelbrot sets that arrive in the air of natural time and regeneration. A blade is still a leaf. So <clears throat> I'm going to stop reading and try to get my computer up again because I want to share with you um, the research, first of all, and then um, share with you, maybe if there's time, a few very short snippets of the fiction. Now, it's really hard to do this with this connection here um, because I thought I'd be able to just put up the, the research sources. So I'll do that later on after I just get through this and share what I've studied. I've been working on this for a very, very long time because in my family I have had the experience of a lot of connection to alcoholism, drug addiction, and mental illness. Um, as many of you, I'm sure many of us have had these kinds of experiences. And so I have been very much interested in this for a very long time. But I've actively been researching this probably for the last three or four years. Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart wrote about the concept of historical trauma in the field of social work and psychology in the 1980s. And according to her website, which I will put up later, uh, she says, historical trauma is the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over the lifespan and across generations emanating from massive group trauma. Native Americans have for over 500 years endured physical, emotional, social, and spiritual genocide from European and American colonist policy. Contemporary Na Native American life has adapted as such. Many are healthy and economically self-sufficient. Yet a significant portion of Native people are not faring as well, she says. Our purpose is to heal from the historical unresolved grief that many indigenous individuals and communities are struggling with. Historical unresolved grief is the grief that accompanies the trauma. And so this is from her website. I think the thing stopped, just to let you know. It, I mean... <laughs> The mic stopped. I don't know what happened, but uh, I'm just going to continue. Did I did I do something to it? No, is it okay? Anyway, she was. Good. There. Although she was the first to create this concept, you know, and deliver it into the fields of social work and psychology, American Indian authors have written about it since at least the 1930s, when Darcy McNichol wrote a book, a novel called The Surrounded, among other novels, showing the problems of our genocidal history. And that's also represented in characters' lives in many of the novelists who came to the fore during what was called the Native American literary renaissance. I'm thinking of N. Scott Mamaday's House Made of Dawn, Leslie Marmon Silko's Ceremony, James Welch's Winter in the Blood and the Death of Jim Loney, and of course later on, Louise Erdrich's Tracks and her trilogy that is part of Tracks. And then recently, um, Mary Jo Moore's uh, collection of autobiographical essays called Genocide of the Mind, uh, where uh, many of the people write autobiographical essays about the problems of their own personal history or uh, collective tribal history and their own personal lives and their present suffering. 
My purpose is to understand how white institutions and avoid genocidal history of American Indians. And the problem with this concept of historical trauma, um, according to a number of uh, critics, but the one that I'm going to mention you might be interested in following up on, and who's written, started to write quite a lot, um, is that according to Joseph Gaughan, uh, it met, misrepresents the wide range of native responses to colonization. <laughs> I don't know. Way at the bottom. I'm here. I hit it, but it died. It isn't going. Anyway. Okay. He says that its emphasis on pathology may stigmatize American Indians who suffer from mental illness, alcoholism, and drug addiction. And because he says, by putting together psychological trauma and colonization history, we may diminish the wide variety of Native people's responses to the past and represent Indians as wounded by history. So the problem is how to portray the wide variety of our responses and our subjective lives um, and contrast or understand them in the, in the context of the particular core beliefs that lead to mental illness, addiction, and alcoholism. And then to find ways to reestablish those healthy core beliefs and values um, that recognize but don't um, take on dysfunctional patterns. And we can't do this really without a deep critique of Western civilization, which I can't get into now because unless you want to ask me questions about it, I can't really, it's very, very complex and I can't really, I can mention some things, but I didn't include that in this discussion. So I use fiction because it's a way to avoid um, stigma toward the people if I write about particular lives, I end up stigmatizing them. And I don't want to do that. Um, so I try then to use um, fiction in order to critique Western civilization, in order to have people understand what the inner experience of a life might be, uh, and to critique the kinds of institutions that are often uh, within urban areas and probably also <laughs> reservations. Uh, for Native people who are seeking some kind of treatment. So Judith Herman, in a book called Trauma and Recovery, gives a useful definition of trauma. It's a psychological trauma is an affliction of the, power, of the powerless. At the moment of trauma, the victim is rendered helpless by overwhelming force. When the force is out of nature, we speak of disasters. When the force is that of other human beings, we speak of atrocities. Traumatic events overwhelm the ordinary systems of care that give people a sense of con control, connection, and meaning. So one of our deepest needs as human beings that are really part of our needs even before we're born and which we have in the womb is the need for connection to other people. We are herd animals. We, connect, we have to connect with others. Uh, we are people who are also create symbol systems, so we also have to generate meaning of our lives. Um, and we do that through language, and we all need a sense of autonomy and control. Traumatized people have experienced psychological harm that affects their responses to life. Trauma occurs in a continuum, if we think of it as a continuum of, of responses and disorders and the kinds of... Um, confrontations of trauma, that, of terrible experiences that people might have. It's a, really a continuum of those that have ca been caused by one single horrific event um, to those that are um, caused by years of repeated abuse. The process of healing and understanding becomes more complex along this continuum as well as more difficult to understand within the framework of current diagnostic concepts. To survive a traumatic event, a person's response, their stress response, begins to occur immediately. So when we are stressed by an event, any event, even a thoughtful event, even a psychological imagined event, what happens in our bodies is that uh, hormones get released. 
Uh, they're called glucocorticoids. And I just lost my place. I have to go down. Okay. The hormones get released and neurons respond in order to establish the body's equilibrium. All animals, especially mammals, respond to threat and stress by releasing hormones that activate our sympathetic nervous system and prepare us to either fight or flee. The person then, because of this response, the person will go numb. In other words, the, the hormones created so that all of the energy is placed in movement, so we get you know, our legs moving, our arms moving, we uh, stop our digestion, does not keep going, uh, we do not think as clearly because we're thinking move, do something, uh, we're either, um, we're not responding, our heart beat, uh, the blood pressure volume, the blood pressure, the heart beats much stronger in order to increase blood flow and reproduction is also shut down so that the body, the person can uh, flee or can fight. So the stress response is not a conscious, I mean we're aware of it but we're not conscious of it, we cannot control it, but in this process of trauma it displaces the memory of an event but the experience itself is not lost to us, it's still within us. So one of the greatest complexities of trauma is the effect on memory and truth. The suppressed event returns, but not as a conscious memory. Uh, the traumatized person feels both the reality of this event and also the numbing. Yet the event intrudes and possesses one's life as if it's coming from outside. And so it can't be easily included within a person's life story. It can't be assimilated into a life story because the uncanny experience resists the limits of language. Can't be easily told. It just can't be told. Within their own subjective experiences, traumatized people feel the presence of unavoidable danger. The stress response evolved in response to short-term stressors. You know, getting attacked by something like, you know, you know, a bear. <laughs> but not to the kind of stress and psychological stress that we experience in the modern world. We're just not built uh, to do that. And so we have then diseases of stress, which are heart disease, diabetes, um, psychological problems such as, as we've been talking about, mental illness, drug addiction, and alcoholism. Once the stress response has occurred, it takes time for the body to reestablish its baseline homeostasis. And so what happens then is the glucocorticoid levels remain high uh, over a period of time. And if you keep getting stressed and stressed and stressed, your glucocorticoid levels are high. So you're feeling a sense of uh, the immediate calmness may come back, but your levels are still high. And what that level does then is it makes you crave carbohydrates. So, of course, you might end up, if you're constantly stressed, you may end up um, putting on a few more pounds than what you thought you would. So, um, once this starts to happen, then I have to just turn the page here. So, as I said, modern traumas are more constant. Um, traumatized people protect themselves by simply shutting down. Henry Crystal, another researcher in the field of trauma, explains that responses to infantile and adult trauma form a paradox. The person impoverishes their sense of self uh, and become unable to feel a range of emotions, uh, yet is hyper aware of the alienated areas of intrusive memories that seem to come from outside oneself. So Crystal explains, and I'm quoting, the fear of one's dreams and one's emotions are all the result of this post-traumatic depletion of the consciously recognized fears of selfhood. In other words, traumatized people often have a hard time explaining their lives uh, easily. This condition that is called alexithemia 
a person, and he says that it, it's, he claims that people who have this condition hold on to certain kinds of infantile wishes. Uh, they want to be omnipotent, they have a desire for perfection, and they feel they've been entitled some way to ideal parents, even though they may have never had ideal parents, they feel like they should have had ideal parents. And these infantile wishes prevent the development of adult emotions, adult affect, he calls it. Uh, so people suffering from alexithemia can't grieve effectively because they don't know how to let go of um, and mature. They can't let go of negative aspects of themselves and uh, they have a low opinion of themselves, yet they continue to have very high expectations. Alexithemia and another comparative, um, what's called uh, anhedonia, which is the in inability to experience pleasure and joy, um, are the results of trauma and are often considered symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. The effects of trauma transfer from one generation to the next, and there's been many studies that have looked at this, uh, particularly among Holocaust survivors, uh, while Holocaust survivors have great difficulty in adjusting and all kinds of psychological problems, it seems that the subsequent generations after the Holocaust have many more difficulties um, in terms of psychological problems and because they can't easily be traced all the time. But there's been work that's done by a neuroscientist at Stanford University. His name is Robert Sapolsky. Um, and what he shared in one of the lectures I saw uh, was that he said that in the winter of 1944, when the Nazis invaded Holland, uh, the Dutch resisted the Nazis. Um, and to punish them then, the Nazis moved all the food to Germany so that the Dutch starved. Many of them starved to death. Some of them survived. It was called the Dutch Hunger Winter. And it's been studied over several generations. He said that one effect of the Dutch hunger winter on women who were in their tri uh, semester of pregnancy was that their bodies became what he called thrifty with nutrients uh, so that the babies didn't get the nutrients that they needed. Uh, and the children's bodies then also followed, once they were born and grew up, the children's bodies also followed this thrifty pattern where they would not uh, release or expend or move uh, the nutrients through their bodies in the same way. So the pattern of withholding nutrients from areas of the body due to a stress response continued through generations so that later generations of children were born from this tri-semester pattern um, ended up experiencing metabolic syndrome such as diabetes and intestinal and um, other stomach conditions. Uh, and it appears that they just had these conditions without understanding how they had been um, promoted through generational transfer due to their mother's um, experience in the hunger winter. In other research, uh, neurologists like Sapolsky found that pregnant mothers who are subjected to prolonged stress over the course of their pregnancy give birth to children whose uh, stress hormone levels are higher than what ought to be normal, and they have uh, fewer receptors for calming themselves. So they grow up to be high-strung children. You are looking at one of the high-strung children. My mother was high-strung, I was always high-strung. Very anxious, very nervous, um, could not easily sit still, um, just had a very hard time, and of course, that you could see perhaps my son also might have similar kinds of issues of anxiety. So um, these children are more, uh, have more difficulties in terms of anxiety. Researchers also uh, confirm uh, the reaction of the body's stress response by looking at children, and this is very long development in psychology, very long studies, um, that really contrasts what happened um, when my grandmother was being raised and my mother was being raised. Um, 
the feeling and the um, sort of Dr. Spock of that period, let's say, 1890s through the 1950s, before Dr. Spock became popular, was a man by the name of Dr. Hart, H-A-R-T, who uh, believed in uh, and promoted the idea of spare the rod and spoil the child. He believed in beatings. <laughs> he believed in um, not uh, of letting the child cry. You know, that if you coddled children, they would be spoiled. So a uh, very sort of, um, I would say, hard, hard discipline. And when we think about boarding school experience, we can see that it comes directly from Hart's ideas of how to raise children. Because children in boarding schools, and people went to boarding schools from the ages of 4 to 41. You know, she's my son, you know, hey, even though you're an adult, you could have ended up in boarding school. Um, so they went to boarding school, even as what we would consider adults, went to boarding school, uh, where they were constantly watched all the time sort of like, um, you know, in, uh, in a prison system, constantly watched and uh, subjected to all kinds of terrible uh, beatings and problems, including uh, sexual abuse. So children need more than food, shelter, and clothing. They need positive physical affection. You know, the way we share our energies with one another is we hug each other, we shake hands on more intimate levels, you know, we kiss, and in that area of our mouths and other areas of our bodies that are more open to blood and the power of blood that connects us, uh, we become, we exchange energy, you know, we exchange this kind of emotional support for one another. And so children need these positive uh, physical affection, and they really do need their parents' attention. They need their parents to pay attention to them, and they will keep getting their parents' attention no matter how hard. They actually need it in order to become full, functioning human beings. They need it to mature and grow. Under severe psychological stress, a child's bodily stress response causes dwarfism. In other words, a child who is under some kind of terrible response uh, to not being paid attention to, to being ignored, to being uh, defined as uh, dysfunctional or to being defined as worthless uh, and then not given any kind of positive value their uh, stress response, uh, the glucocorticoids, stop the release of growth hormones, and so they simply don't grow. They just stay. You cannot grow if you are running away or if you're planning to fight or flight. You, it just makes perfectly good sense for the body to shut down the ability to grow. So the child becomes stunted in their growth. So this is part of the kinds of neurological studies that have been done that help us to understand the transfer of, of patterns of behavior that um, have a tremendous effect on generations. So not only just in terms of the physical change, but also in terms of how, our, how we handle emotions and how we enter maturity. Um, and now I just want to say a few things about addiction. Um, and that addiction, including alcoholism, uh, could be and is often considered a problem of faulty core beliefs. The way a person grows up leads them to believe that they are unworthy, that they are inadequate, and they are afraid. So to compensate for these feelings of unworthiness, addicts often mask their fears by trying to control other people. And in um, alcoholic and addictive family systems, the roles of the members switch from control to compliance. So um, in two, usually it's two people. One is an addict, the other one is a codependent or co-addict. One will comply and enable. The other one becomes, you know, uses, and then they may switch their patterns back and forth. Um, but not at any way do, does this switching um, 
from control to compliance ever confront the issue of each person's feelings of unworthiness. So there's a really wonderful book uh, that's very, been very helpful and insightful to me. Uh, it was, it's called uh, Out of the Shadows, Understanding Sexual Addiction by Patrick Carnes. And he gives a very clear idea of how addiction works. And there's a lot of, I have some websites information that will show you the patterns. You can almost see it in people sometimes, is that there is, of course, the feelings of unworthiness, of depression, you know, you know, I feel like shit, you know, I really feel bad, what can I do? Ideation, then people start having ideas about, gee, the last time I really felt good, you know, was down at the Golden Rail, and we had a great time, and I was with my friends, so you start ideas, thinking about what a great time it would be and like how maybe just a beer or, you know, a shot of vodka would be really nice and calm you down, make you feel less horrible. Uh, and so there's the ideation and the expectation and then once the person is confirmed in their addictive pattern, it's like they enter a trance. It's like they're just going to go do this. They enter a trance they complete the process of the behavior of using that gets them into trouble, somehow causes their, um, their sense of worthlessness or feeling, bad feelings to kind of resolve toward the end of whatever that pattern is, that behavior that they engage in. And then they may wake up feeling again, despondent, despair, depressed um, about what they've done, and the pattern starts all over again. So, In order to heal, addicts have to confront and examine their core belief systems um, and question uh, in order to change the patterns of habitual thought. And it's difficult to do this. It takes the support of other people to do this. The genocide that Indians experienced and the ongoing loss of our land, opportunities, meaningful careers and employment, education, the confrontations and problems that we have with poverty, uh, with our need to connect with other people that is often stymied by these kinds of histories and difficulties in relating to each other, um, are, are, are these all contribute to addiction and contribute to mental illness and contribute to alcoholism. Now, one way around this is to challenge the imposition of core beliefs about our unworthiness. And one way to do that is to examine the racist policies um, and the political system, racist political system, and the assumptions of Western civilization so that one can find out about a personal history and link it to other community members' histories which will have a healing effect on a community because people will begin to understand they are not unworthy. Um, they are the victims of genocide and they need to look at and see how that affects them. As our communities begin to examine and challenge individually and collectively our core beliefs, uh, we then can understand and confirm and affirm our own worth and find ways to protect our self-esteem in a community of mutual support with the knowledge of how our histories have affected our feelings and our very bodily reactions. With this kind of understanding, we can revitalize our ways of life in order to dignify each other and to dignify our cultural traditions. So I'm just going to stop right now to see if you have questions or comments or reactions. We have some time to talk. And so I'd be interested in hearing your reactions to what I've had to say. Um, one of the things I didn't get to mention that I'll just say real briefly is that as wonderful as modern science is, if you look at the rise of modern science, what it actually did was it ripped away human beings' connection to um, a soulful universe. In other words, right now, if we think about scientific inquiry, which is really great, it's done really good things, and I, again, I quote Sapolsky, who's a neuro, 
you know, a neurologist. But one of the problems with, psych, with um, science is that we end up in a universe that is not sacred. That is not, we're not connected to it. We don't have a feeling of connectedness to it. And that has then, of course, caused this tremendous ecological tr crisis uh, where people are not aware of how much we are destroying the earth. So one of the things that native cultures do and have is we do still retain. We're one of the few groups, if we think of, of um, tribal communities worldwide or indigenous communities worldwide, we were in a universe that was sacred and connected not more than two or three generations ago. I mean, we have that kind of understanding that I think the world desperately needs and requires if we're going to alter patterns uh, and, and experience the change of, you know, the depletion of fossil fuels and the changing weather patterns and all of that. We need to reestablish re our own ways of understanding <coughs> that we're in a sacred world. Yes. I'm probably more creative as a writer than um, a scholar. Um, and I do scholarship in very minimal kinds of ways in my research, and I hope to do that more. But um, I don't think of myself at this point um, as a scholar um, who has published a lot of scholarship. I think publishing scholarship is very difficult because People often have frames, you know, publishers have frames of reference in terms of theory. What kind of theory do you have? And if you don't have this kind of theory that's connected to the group of people in that publishing house who are familiar with that theory, then it gets difficult to find a publisher. Writing is similar in that there's our schools of different kinds of writing. Even within Native American uh, writing, there's different schools of writing. Um, creative writing and so but because I have more of a track record there it may be easier to publish fiction I publish some fiction so doing both of them are uh, is interesting to do because I find that they feed off of each other when I read work in scholarly studies you know or listen to people like Sapolsky I start thinking about all kinds of things that a character might do you know but the two forms are very different, as you've pointed out. Art is what, is what we would call non-discursive. In other words, it's not meant to teach you anything directly. It teaches you by giving you the experience of something. You know, like watching a TV program. You feel the experience of it, and then from that experience, you try to figure out what it means. Whereas scholarship is discursive, it's going to tell you in some way or another what the arguments are and why it's, it's taking this particular position. So I find they help each other out, but I think both fields are, are difficult um, and just require a lot of time. And sometimes we don't always have that kind of time to think these things through. So I'm always trying to find time um, but working at a university, I always thought university professor just kind of laid around, thought, read, wrote. No, it's not true. You end up on committees and people want certain things to do. I have recently edited, and what took me so long in getting organized for coming here is I recently edited a magazine, and I'll send you the link, uh, called About Place. Um, it's part of an organization called the Black Earth Institute. And my uh, issue that I edited, and, and I thought they told me it wouldn't take too long. It took enormous amounts of time. Um, but it's on the um, indigenous um, people and marginalized people and small island nations people's response to global warming. So there's uh, work from all over. I understand that the reason people are so interested in Trump is because they're, they're waking up to 
colonization in a way that um, perhaps we didn't do in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, they're starting to see how its effects are ongoing and very um, inter interwoven with what happens to other people. And if you think about it, it's connected in terms of Americans, um, what, what is called the American racial contract. The idea that white people are real people. <laughs> are people people? Like white people are real people, and that other people of color are not necessarily, you know, real. Yeah. And the unreality is that people think of, of um, let's just say people of color, in very strange ways. You know, I mean, I've been asked things like, do I have a TP in my horses? You know, um, I'm living in a city, and people ask me, where are your horses? And which, do you have a TP? You know, maybe I would like a TP, but I don't have one. Um, so they ask these kinds of questions because Within American racism and the hierarchies that cre get created, people have generally, public generally has very false beliefs in order to maintain a political system that is based on white privilege. You know, my students hate to hear this, but they start to understand that they have been hurt also. Equal, yeah, you know, they've been wounded in their education because they've been taught an unreality that doesn't exist. They believe in groups of people who respond to certain kinds of ways, when in fact they're not going to respond that way at all. So they don't get a sense of this kind of truth. And they're amazed by the idea of being connected to other people, interconnected, the interconnected nature of many of our traditions and the ways in which we think about things. So Oneidas, we have our belief system which took me very many years to discover, you know, because I was raised within a colonial system um, and taught, you know, how to fit in. But I had an older cousin uh, who um, studied and speaks the language. His name is Jerry Hill. He is the executive uh, president of the Indigenous Language Institute. And one of the things he said to me was, you know, Oneidas and other Longhouse people believe that when we're born, we have a negative mind. And we have to have a negative mind because, you know, uh, uh, something could jump out and grab us and we have to pay attention to the negative things that happen. And so he said that we have to practice um, having positive, a positive mind. We have to grow and nurture a positive mind. Um, and that process of nurturing a positive mind is one that establishes within your realm of relationships with other people a non-adversarial approach. That you're not creating adversaries. And that you're grateful. You have appreciation for anything that comes to you. You know, you love your obstacles. Uh, which I think is very helpful. You know, to appreciate whatever comes to you and to nurture a sense of positive recovery from everything that you see. Um, and Vine Deloria said the same thing in an essay about how Lakota people in a traditional ways confer dignity on all forms of life. You know? So I think mean, you're talking about that sense of discovery, traditions, <coughs> this interconnectedness. Right? And many Native communities have that. Uh, the problem with the Indians <clears throat> is that we really feel terrible over the loss of our lands and the ways in which our lands are constantly being threatened. Um, right now, the um, Ojibwe's from Bad River are confronting um, a terrible um, mining issue in northern Wisconsin. There's one of the last uh, watersheds among the Great Lakes up north, um, in the north of Wisconsin. Um, one of the last remaining pristine watersheds in the country. Um, is facing off with the governor's desire to <coughs> bring in a mine, a uh, mine, in uh, certain areas. And there's a big mine uh, area, <coughs> you know, I'm trying to think of the name of the hills, but the whole area where this island where is very rich. And so, <coughs> a mining company, a transnational mining company, wants to mine 
the governor is very much supportive of this, but it's going to destroy, you know, the watershed and the, and the rice beds, the minimum beds that the that people have protected um, and sacrificed for for many generations. So we constantly are facing these kinds of issues. Yes. Is there any kind of a example of some nation, be it tribal or whatever, where they were likewise faced with colonial oppression and <clears throat> pulled themselves together to come out of it? And how long a period of time in which were they able to do something like this? You know, when it comes to tribalism, and you talk about tribal colleges and universities, and when I was recruited out of my doctorate program at the University of Minnesota <coughs> by medicine men, and told to come back here and develop a vehicle to strengthen the Sichangu Nation. And you go about, you know, establishing that type of a system, and yet everything that you face, you know, is really opposition. Uh, all of your laws, all of your policies, uh, probably the two most important, or certainly two important documents that govern this country and, and uh, and really Christianity, the U.S. Constitution, and the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And yet the very thing that we revere spiritually and culturally that defines us, our own land, and the connectedness that you talked about, is not contained in either one of those documents. And all of life seems to be patterned after what is contained in those. And that's just, you know, in opposition to who we are for the most part. And it just looks like, you know, it's almost uh, an impossible venture that you're, you're up against in trying to address it, where you can one day say, hey, I regained who we are and we're standing on our own feet. Uh, and I'm just wondering what other civilizations in times, you know, past have been faced with this, either through extermination by disease or warfare or what have you. And how long did that take, you know, for them to seemingly, you know, get back on their feet? I know in one of my last conversations with Russell Means, he was telling me, he said, Lionel, I can't do anything here on the Pine Ridge. It's impossible. The colonialism did too good a job on us, and it's almost as if there's no way out. And here's a man that had a tremendous spiritual belief and, you know, gave his life and took bullets and knives and clubbings and went to prison for his belief. But, you know, come to a conclusion that was really, you know, a tough one. And seemingly, you know, that's what kind of awaits us, and we do the best we can to address it, but, uh, you know, is, 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 it, is this going to be a struggle in perpetuity? I guess is what, you know, it comes down to. I was trying to think if there is any group of people that I can think of that have sort of recovered from colonization. Uh, I can't think of one right now. But what I can say is we have to think of this in a big perspective um, as kind of a long revolution, a long perspective. Um, if we think about, for example, my grandparents' generation, uh, my grandparents were born in 1873, 1876. Uh, my grandfather was taken by train at the age of 13 to Carlisle, Pennsylvania didn't return until he was in his late 30s. Could not return even for his father's death. Terribly controlled by the uh, Carlisle Indians. 
and uh, he and Colonel Pratt fought with each other over rules. Uh, my father, my grandfather ran off and ran away. My grandmother, no knowledge of how she was connected to the Mohawks, but also tremendously alienated from Native people and from the Quaker people in her milieu. She just was not connected to anybody. Very easily. Or how to connect and then reconnect and disconnect. But when she found Native people in, in Carlisle, that was who she wanted to be around. And she eventually married my grandfather. But their group, that particular um, generation was struggling just to survive. I mean, they were just trying to survive uh, and had no insight into how their minds had been um, sort of put into the groove of Western culture. And if you look at the images of uh, boarding schools, often, you know, images or pictures of kids who are dressed in flags and dressed as George Washington and, you know, Thomas Jefferson and all these kind of very strange uh, contradictions that they're being taught to uphold. So that's that generation. If I went back prior to that generation, my great-great-grandfather's generation, they were then still struggling, but they had their communities. Uh, they knew what communities they were from. They were still speaking their language. Um, they were confronted with um, settlement coming in and trying to hold on to their lands communally. So that was their struggle. So I think then of my father's generation, once again, not very aware of his interior experience being shaped by Western colonization, um, knowing that he needed to resist termination and help the tribe resist termination at Oneida, but not really having a whole lot of insight into how it affected him personally. Uh, no insight into his alcoholism. So we think about this as a long process, then my generation starting to become more aware of how these uh, impositions of these Western beliefs have affected us and trying to release ourselves from internalized colonization and that feeling of being worthless and that feeling of being powerless and the feeling that we can indeed do something as you have done. You know as all of you have done. To think of ways to alter and change the exterior process but the interior as well. But what we have to realize, too, is that this is a tremendously chaotic system that we're in. Western civilization and capitalism is chaotic and extremely adaptable and very powerful. Uh, and it will, in time, collapse at times. It does collapse, as we've seen in the 1930s. It'll collapse, and when it collapses, then people are open to trying to think of ways to change. But because of... Um, because of the crisis in the environment, uh, there will be other real difficult kinds of changes going on that perhaps the generation of my children's generation are working toward um, altering. So just because we don't see how everyone can get along, you know, I think you told me years ago when I went home that um, there's nothing more difficult than working among your own people. <laughs> and that's really true. Well, we have a saying in Oneida, things are so bad here, they're stabbing each other in the front. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, things get very difficult in working with uh, the tribal communities. But part of that is, of course, that along with these kinds of tensions and dislike, um, we have to realize we're working through some very hard obstacles. Um, uh, we don't always all get along, but as my relatives keep reminding me, we do need all these different perspectives to eventually try to come to terms with what will be supportive and helpful for all of us. And there are moments when people do care and share and get together. But we've, we've had an imposed political system that supports 
the racist political system. So it gets really difficult. You know, we we are not. I don't know. We're not really a government. We're a corporation. You know, we are. You know, IRS corporation. So.
make that connection? I mean, at the moment, uh, avatars jump in my head and they're talking about the, the physical connection of the trees to the earth in that movie. Mm -hmm. But we <clears throat> don't have that Western knowledge of that connection to the body. But you, when you just said that we are physical connectors between the sky mm -hmm. and our bodies. I know in the records of the history that I read um, that many Native people, especially in this area, felt very comfortable sitting on the earth. Just finding a spot and sitting on the earth, they found it to be very um, comforting uh, and to be very good to do that. Mm -hmm. And you will see children do that. You know, I mean, children are very connected to their energies. and so. And they also are very connected to the truth of what they see. They have to be trained to ignore it, you know. So um, they have the ability to be able to just sit on the earth and enjoy sitting on the earth um, and to feel the energies of the earth, uh, to sit next to a tree. Um, there's a practice um, that I like, but it isn't, I don't know if it's a Western or Native practice, but it was done by D.H. Lawrence from England, who liked to sit with his back against a tree. Because what he said was he could feel the sap rising in, you know, in the tree, and it made him feel better. And so I have um, particular trees that I find as friends, and I like to go and sit next to them, or sit with my back next to them. Because if you think of your spinal column, if you look at your spinal column, it looks very much tree-like. You know, it rises up in the back, and then it has all these branching nerve endings and neurons that go all over your body. You know, and then it connects itself, you know, like your tailbone. Um, and so, to sit with your back against a tree can be very comforting. Um, I think just being able to look up at the stars, and that's one thing that's so very horrible to think about uh, for Native people who especially are in prisons. You know, they don't get to see the night sky. They don't, may not get to see the sky at all. And so to go out and just be underneath the stars and feel the stars and see the moon, how wonderful, what a good feeling that gives you. And these are all ways of coming to a sense of lowering our stress levels. Because we're extremely stressed out. Um, of just calming ourselves <coughs> and taking our lives more slowly. Because what is happening, I think, as I read in different places, is um, the system we're in, the uh, capitalist system, <coughs> takes what people make and turns it into a commodity, into an object. And it does that also with human beings. Who are wage laborers. Excuse <coughs> me. You know, they I have no people who work four or five jobs, you know, trying to make it. <coughs> and a terrible stressful reaction. So I'm gonna have to stop in a minute talking. <coughs> but these kinds of ways that we can take life more slowly, calm ourselves down, enjoy each other, you know, just we'll find that we might be able to relate to each other better and to be healthier. Um, the global corticoid levels may start to drop. You know, we might not find ourselves, you know, um, I suppose feeling, you know, uh, the stress of an increased heart rate. Music is wonderful. Uh, music and drumming and dancing, all of those things help us to connect. Oh, thank you. All of those things help us to connect to uh, positive healing energies. You know, uh, um, touch is extremely important. We're in, we're in a society that because of its Puritan origins, rejects people hugging each other 
If you go to certain countries like Brazil, uh, when I was amazed about Brazil, and they often laughed at me because they said you come from a Puritan country. Because they embrace each other, they kiss each other, they rub each other, they you know touch each other. And we don't see that, you know, in this country. You don't see people doing that. Um, but there's a certain kind of joy that occurs when people have embraced each other, come close to each other. And we have all these kinds of resistances to that, um, which was not a part of our traditional ways, I'm pretty sure. I don't see anything, I don't see the culture is dying or falling apart or losing or evolving. I see it as growing. I mean, because I grew up in the 1950s when our leaders, if they had a question, they called the BIA. There was no self determination. They called the BIA and asked, What would we do? And the BIA Solicitor General told them to do this and this and this, and so they did it. Whether the community handled it or not. That doesn't happen anymore. There's more and more increasing awareness of how valuable our ways are. And just because it's not going to affect the major culture. You know. You don't think it will. You don't. Well, I think the major culture right now is being affected by it, by people coming and trying to learn. Right. You know? When you look in various uh, research on global warming and issues of global warming, then it's amazing. It's amazing how uh, people comment on native values without ever identifying them as native values. You know, this whole idea of interconnectedness and of uh, uh, respect for all life forms. And think of uh, Suzuki, you know, um, who broke the web of life. You know, these ideas are good. So I don't see it as something that um, is going to. Evolve. I mean, we're trying very hard to maintain our language at Oneida, which contains a whole other way of looking at the world that is relational, not necessarily objective. I don't think it'll so much evolve. I think that these beliefs have been around since the beginning of man, anyways. I think they've been around that long, but to actually uphold the history that goes behind that and connects it to the now, I mean, how can they, how are they going to be able to hold on to that and teach their children that? Well, it's a process of awareness and maturity. People begin to try to figure it out, you know, what, at whatever age right. they are. They try to figure it out at a certain moment, and they become then more enlightened as to where things happen within a generational structure. Over the generations, what has happened. So, I have a lot of faith in people that they're going to start to look for things and find things out. Roberta, um, you talked about the historical trauma, but um, I know that yeah. there's also discussion about genetic memory when we talk about historic trauma. Mm -hmm. And genetic memory is what a lot of our kids, our young people who are taking our classes, all of a sudden realizing, you know, I already knew this. Mm -hmm. It's things that we already knew because of our genetics. And so, you know, I think when we talk about are we losing our culture, are we losing our way of life, we aren't going to do that as long as we have people who still tell our stories. Mm -hmm. But I think every generation renews the culture in a certain kind of way. And that whole spiritual connection we have, the spiritual geography of, of place. Mm -hmm. of who we are as kind of people within this place, mm -hmm. or within the Black Hills, you know, those are the things that our children, our grandchildren, are going to have because they still have that genetic memory. And, and I think the more we can overcome the historic drama, trauma that the kids have, the stronger that's going to be. You know, I think in my, what my daughter says, uh, she, my stepdaughter, she says that, um, you know, people do connect and they do find a spiritual path and that her generation, she's reminding me, her generation is interconnecting urban natives with reservation natives. That's part of their task, she says. So that's why our culture survives, because you're able to adapt to whatever 
your conditions are at that point. Mm -hmm. Did you have a comment? Yeah, and I was going to uh, comment earlier on the trees. Floyd Westerman used to always say his main deal was to hug a tree. Yeah. And, you know, that's kind of where he come from. But back to what Jerry's talked about here, the genetics and how it's tied into us through DNA and spirituality. I had an experience yesterday that... Uh, you know, this institution was really born out of <clears throat> spirituality. And medicine men played a tremendous part. And they always talked about the pipe and the ceremonies and the prayer to keep it going. And there's times, you know, uh, that's what kept us going. But in the last couple of days, I got a phone call from a young man here who is in Rapid City. And he said, Lionel, he said, I come across advertisement they're going to auction off one of spotted tails uh, or a spotted tails pistol and he gave me the history of it that he come across on the internet and it was going to happen at one o'clock yesterday so I called him at 11 and asked him you know how do we go about this and he wasn't uh, there he was Guiding a hunt or something. So I left a voicemail. And I called back at, uh, or he called me at 3.15. And he said, Lionel, he said, uh, I just checked. I got your message. And he said, Spotted Tail's pistol is number 648. And now they're bidding on 646. So I was, you know, the coincidence of the timing, uh, a few seconds more and we'd have lost out. He said, uh, it's on now. And while he and I were talking, he must, you know, had the internet, whatever the, the connection is. And he said, it's on now. And the first bid is 4,500. He said, uh, what shall I do? He said, it's up to 5,000. And just by the time you can count to two, the next number was, he said, it's up to 6,000. I said, go seven. He said, uh, okay. He said, it's up to eight. It's up to 9,000. And I said, uh, go 10. And he said, okay. He said, it's up to 11,000. I mean, this all happened in about 10 seconds. And so I said, uh, go 11, five, but let me say a prayer. And I'm going to pray that, you know, that belongs here. It needs to, you know, and end that bid at 11.5. And he called back about three seconds later. He said, we got it. I mean, you know, phenomenal. Here was a bid going, moving, and all of a sudden, you know, we put in a prayer and we get the, we get the pistol. So it has a... Uh, a ledger that Crow Dog, uh, when he was in jail, did and showed the showing where he shot uh, Spotted Tail. He was on horseback, and and it just you know it has a crow and a dog in there, and it's been supposedly authenticated by the University of California out of San Diego. There's a story there, and it uh, tells about this one postmaster who used to work here, who interceded and. and at that time, so it's just been, you know, it's a phenomenal deal, but talking about spirituality and prayer and how it, you know, brought this, so as soon as we pay for this pistol, you know, we'll bring it back here and ask the medicine men, you know, what uh, what is that we need to do it now to bring it back into our possession, and so yeah, the spirituality that's innate, within us, through DNA, what have you, genetics, uh, you know, it's just phenomenal. And so once it comes back, then, it is no longer a commodity. Once it returns here, it is no longer a commodity. It becomes uh, perhaps a gift. You know, it becomes a way of forming and finding and learning about other relationships. Like you said, it has all this ledger information that will show the relationships of people. And then the people here can form a relationship 
with that particular historical uh, object, which represents relationships. You know, so, um, you know, we, we had an experience in Unaya uh, when I was the director of American Indian Studies way back in the 90s, mm -hmm. where there was an anthropologist or archaeologist who um, was digging around in the archives at the university and he found a whole set of archives of, in our language uh, from the 1930s um, WPA projects that the Oneidas never received. And so he was an archaeologist and not an anthropologist, so he found another colleague who was an anthropologist to say, you tell everybody who found these. And so this guy told everybody he found them. And they managed to come back to the tribe um, but there's been a tremendous kind of evolution of that particular set of archives, too, uh, where people um, first want to control them, because it's sort of kind of knowledge, but eventually it leaks out and everybody gets to know what's going on. You know, because it contains a lot of information, a lot of jokes, a lot of ways of looking at things that uh, we had no idea about. Uh, so, uh, when things like that come back, they provide an impetus to further discoveries, you know, and further understanding of what the situation of people wants, you know, what happens to people, how they relate to each other. So it's really good. So, and we thank you for coming back. Well, thank, thank you. you. I enjoyed it. I was like to come back.